Sean Stokwa, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Erica. Excited to be here. Excited to have you. And I was really worried to butcher your last name, but we got it sorted before we started recording. So that's good. Yeah. No, that <laughs> so we're off to a good start. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I've had it pretty bad. I, in the past. I am so excited for today's topic on ankle injuries, ankle rehab, and ankle prehab as well. We have a lot of soccer players who listen, also some basketball and lacrosse, uh, mainly female athletes, and you are my go-to in this area. So before we get into all that, why don't you just let everyone know what you do and what types of athletes you're currently working with? Sure. So... My name is John Stokwa. I'm a physical therapist and strength coach. I also play professional basketball in Europe for the past few years and in Canada I've been playing. And most of the time when I'm in Canada, I'm working one-on-one -on -one private clinics with different athletes. I work with a lot of basketball players because that's my main sport and that's the sport I've been playing. That's where I know a lot of different people. Worked with a few NBA guys and a bunch of different overseas professionals. And also worked in a little bit with some uh, football players as well. I have a little bit of a football history, which we'll get into. But right, right now I'm in Europe. I'm living in Bulgaria, close to the capital in Sofia, and a little town called Botovgrad, which is really nice. And I'm working as a strength coach here for a professional basketball team where I'm training their, their professional team as well as their under-19 kind of development team as well. So... You know, specialize in ankle rehab. Myself, I've had three ankle surgeries as well as one ACL surgery. So I spend a lot of time with people, you know, with ankle rehab as well as knee rehab, specifically, you know, post-surgical ankle and post-surgical knee rehab. Can you get a little bit more into how serious your ankle injuries were and just the whole recovery process that you had to go through to ensure you went back to the field better than you were before the surgery? Yeah, totally. So when it would have been when I was 20 years old in 2013 now, wow, that's, that's tough. I guess I'm 30 these days. But yeah, so when, uh, when I was playing football in university, my junior year, my third year, I fractured and dislocated my ankle playing football in practice. One day I just went to, I was playing defensive back and I went to break up a pass and my foot got stuck in the turf while I took some contact in the upper body. And there was an element of rotation in that injury as well. And yeah, my, I knew right away that I had, something was wrong because I kind of, I heard the fracture and I felt it. And, you know, when I looked down, my ankle was dislocated, pointing the other direction. So I kind of rolled over, changed the position of my leg and the whole ankle just kind of shifted back into place. And yeah, like I said, I could tell right away that something wasn't right and that I had done some serious damage, but you never really know how serious the damage is because sometimes you can get away with, you know, just a fibula fracture or even a tibia fracture, which isn't necessarily the end of the world. But when you add in ligament damage and when the syndesmosis, kind of the area that holds the whole ankle together is affected, that's when things get a little bit tricky. So for me, I had a spiral fracture of the fibula that went up about halfway up the bone. I had dislocated my ankle and I had torn pretty much all the major ligaments, including the, the medial deltoid ligaments on the inside. So by the time I got to the hospital, my ankle was more swollen than I had ever seen any ankle really like the size of probably a softball realistically. And at that point I knew, okay, something's like this, this really isn't good. And I went in for surgery the next day, you know, they did some x-rays that night. They could tell right away there was a fracture. But again, you don't know how serious it is until you see the, the damage elsewhere. So after a couple more tests, they were able to determine that I needed surgery the next day. And basically what I had done was I had a plate put on my fibula, about 12 inches of metal where they put screws into the fibula to realign it. And then they put what's called a syndesmotic screw through the entire ankle joint, connecting my tibia and my fibula so that the whole ankle would heal in proper alignment and then they stitched back up my medial deltoid ligaments on the inside so that was the initial surgery and that that took place the next day it's not really a surgery that you want to wait too long for and I remember the next night you know after or the next day in general after I came out of surgery that was the most pain I had ever been in in my life like the injury itself wasn't too bad because when you get hurt you know you get hurt the adrenaline's really flowing and there really wasn't much pain at all 
but once you have a, a surgeon cut you open and and start drilling you know screws into your bones then when those painkillers wear off the next day your body lets you know about it and there's really not a lot the painkillers can do for you at that point i remember asking you know the nurses for more morphine and whatever other painkillers i was on but it just wasn't helping at that point so it was a bit of a grind the next day but um yeah that was the uh that was the extent of my injury and and for people who are listening who aren't super familiar if you think of something like it was similar to what dak prescott had when he uh when he messed his ankle up a few years ago Gordon Hayward in the NBA had a similar injury where he came down from a, a fall and dislocated his ankle. So that's uh, that's the type of injury that I was dealing with. And that, that surgery has developed over the past decade. For example, a lot of times now, they don't do that syndesmotic screw through the middle. Rather, they'll, they'll put a, a mesh through the ankle these days. Uh, they seem to have advanced the surgery a little bit. And uh, I think that's probably for the best in hindsight. But Definitely an injury that you can come back from, especially if you have a good team of physical therapists and strength coaches to support you. But if you don't or, you know, something goes wrong uh, along the process, kind of similar to an ACL surgery, uh, like the majority of people don't make it back to their previous level or, you know, the level above that because uh, it's just a significant injury. And I remember the the surgeon telling me that, hey, this is, uh, you know, a career ending injury for most football players. And uh you know, it's good to to kind of have that reality check sometimes because it it's a reflection of how much work you need to put in in the rehab process to get back to where you want to get to. Wow, that is not an easy road. And the the amount of pain you were in, I'm sure it was just really unbearable at times. <laughs> and man, it's um it's interesting hearing from people who had injuries this severe that they get into physical therapy or performance because of that. And it was this a situation where you look back and you're like, man, I wish I could have done things a little bit differently to maybe have reduced the chance of that happening. And has that kind of gone into your work today? Totally big time. That's a great question. And that's a big part of the message that I try to share with the uh, with just people in general these days, I wouldn't, I don't want to say my patients because at that point, usually when someone's already come to see me, it's a bit too late. But that being said, it's good to go over the things that are within your control to prevent re-injury from happening or injury in the first place. So I'll give you a quick backstory on, I guess, some of the things that would have led to my injury. So one of them was just completely neglecting foot and ankle training in general. Like maybe I did some calf raises like most athletes, but from, you know, the calf down, it was kind of an afterthought, you know what I mean? And and part of that was ignorance on my part, you know, not knowing what to do, um, you know, and part of that too, maybe isn't, I, I wasn't able to find the right guidance or the right strength coach who was able to stress how important training that lower limb is to prevent re-injury or even to increase performance. But, you know, I had my fair share of ankle sprains like any youth athlete, and I definitely didn't take the the proper approach to rehabbing those injuries because they slowly kept bothering me over time. And I remember getting orthotics at a certain age. I can't remember exactly what age, but I know that for sure the year or two leading up to my injury, I was wearing orthotics. And, you know, I think a lot of people are in orthotics that don't need to be necessarily, right? Like it's a situation where you go in to see someone, you're in pain. Maybe you have a collapsed arch when maybe you shouldn't in the first place. And someone sticks you in an orthotic just to get you out of pain in the short term and you just neglect all the strengthening and stability work that should be done to reestablish that arch strength in the first place. So I was definitely in that boat where, you know, I wasn't doing any stability or really any mobility work either on the ankle and foot or arch. And rather I was wearing an orthotic and I was constantly spraining my ankles. Like I remember my first year playing basketball on my second year, I would, I would just be, driving down the court in a fast break, try to jump for a layup. And I'd sprain my ankle jumping like that. And it was, it was like medial sprains for the most part, which are really annoying. They're not your classic inversion sprains where you sprain the outside ligaments. I was getting a lot of medial ankle sprains. So my medial ankle ligaments were already weak prior to my significant injury. And I had suffered what's called a, a subluxation of my talus twice leading into that, uh, you know, major dislocation. So the subluxation is just a, a partial dislocation or, you know, when the tail is kind of slips in and out of alignment and, and it might go back, but there's still a lot of tissue damage and there's still 
some lagging instability in the ankle usually. So both of those injuries were uh, definitely contributing factors to my, my major injury. And as a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but as we've kind of recognized as healthcare professionals, one of the best predictors of injury is previous injury. So I think, you know, my history is a great example of that, where I had two previous subluxations on that same ankle. And then that led to a more significant injury, you know, within the next year. And part of it as well was playing through those injuries. For example, I was in a situation in my sophomore year where I suffered that second subluxation during training camp and football season. And I didn't want to lose my starting spot. So I just kind of played through it. Maybe I took a week off, but then I came back you know, probably before I should have and kept playing through pain and just dealing with it, taping up the ankle, icing it. And eventually that caught up to me. Whereas, you know, if you're able to to sit out and you're able to take the time to properly rehab, you can, you can avoid some of those injuries, even if you do suffer a, an initial smaller injury in the first place. Now, I want to get into how we can reduce our chance of ankle injuries the best we can. So you mentioned we need to start at, at the foot and think about that. I think a lot of people tend to just focus on the ankle or maybe even the calves. And I'm definitely guilty of that as well, just doing calf raises or toe walks. But what are some things everyone should start doing to really strengthen the foot and then just really build that base from the ground up? Yeah, so great question. And uh, I mean, the calves don't hurt. The calves definitely help contribute, whether it's the gastroc or the soleus, but I think, yeah, if we're starting say from, from the toes up and the, and the forefoot, I think one of the biggest things people can do is just get out of their shoes a little more frequently when they're, when they're at home or when they're doing, you know, training. I mean, the thing is it's, it's tricky to, to start with barefoot or minimalist training right away for everything you're doing, right? The foot and the ankle are generally very detrained, similar to the hands and wrists. It's like, they're just not as strong as they could be or should be. So you want to ease into things. But generally speaking, getting out of your shoe and getting in a minimalist shoe, whether that's like a Vivo barefoot shoe or a zero shoe. I remember when I originally switched, I had a, a New Balance minimalist shoe, which I'm not as much a fan of as those other as the previous two brands that I mentioned. But that made a huge difference for me uh, switching into that barefoot shoe, uh, you know, just gives your your brain better proprioception about what's going on at the level of the ground because a big a big part of you know having stable ankles and, and healthy ankles is proprioception just the ability for your brain to know where that foot is in space where your center of mass and where your gravity is distributed on that foot and it's hard to feel when you're in a shoe that's cushioned by you know half an inch of, of rubber or whatever it is so first thing you can do start spending less time with shoes on because that's going to help restore your proprioception it's also going to start to help restore your mobility through your toes and that forefoot because a lot of people have a crunched in big toe and a lot of that's just from you know crunching it in a shoe for 20 years um i know some people like to say bunions are genetic but i'm not a huge fan of that approach i think it's just you know wolf's law where form follows function and if you're constantly asking that of your foot to to move in a certain way in this position then it's going to adapt and your body will adapt too once you take the shoe away it'll you like people will notice it generally will take several months up to a year but there's visible changes in your foot from you know increased surface area to thicker tissue stronger foot muscles like it's it's very clear that your foot adapts when the shoe is not part of the equation any longer so that that's the first thing the second thing would be that big toe extension is really something that i think a lot of people can work on you know mobility wise whether that's you know, a, a needle wall kind of dorsiflexion exercise where you put that big toe up on a ball and you dorsiflex into it. It just helps open up all the tissues, the plantar fascia below the foot, which also runs up the calf as well. So it's also important to consider that a lot of those tissues are connected that are running below your foot, up the back of your calf and up your leg. So the big toe extension is a really important one. And that's something that you can mobilize daily, whether that's with that needle wall one or sitting back with your toes underneath you, if you know what I mean, like sitting back on your heels, that's also an effective way to help open up that, uh, that big toe extension and just your plantar fascia in general. And then another one of my favorites is what's called the foot glove, where you try to interlace your fingers and your toes, and then you just move all your toes up and down 
or circles one direction or the other direction. I still remember the first time I tried that the probably a couple months after I had surgery. And I remember I could barely get my fingers into my toes. Like I just had no ability to splay my toes. And it was very, I wouldn't say it was very painful, but it was uncomfortable. And now it's something, it's something that I do, you know, I won't say daily, but weekly for sure. And I enjoy it. It's kind of, it feels nice. You know, it's a, uh, it's a really, it's really one that I come back to because I realize that it's very helpful. So those are a few things that you can do to start to make changes at the toes and the forefoot. And then a couple other things you want to do is just release the tissues below your foot because we have several layers of tissue below the foot, you know, whether that's muscle or fascia or a combination of the both, just doing some pressure point release with a lacrosse ball or a similar ball that has a little bit of stiffness to it can be really effective just to release those tissues. Cause I mean, we're on our feet all day. So naturally those tissues are getting a lot of work and they're building up some tension and it's good to, to give them some love. So I think a mistake or maybe something that people don't do in an ideal way is they roll their, their plantar fascia and those tissues very lightly and superficially, where I think it's a little more effective to actually press down with some of your body weight and almost find the spots that are trigger points or a bit sore and spend a good, you know, 30 seconds on some of those points. And that can go a long way to help with, with foot pain as well. So that helps address the midfoot. And then when it comes to the rest of the ankle, we, I mean, we got a lot of bones down there that, uh, that sometimes get a little bit stiff and I've kind of found ways to, to work on those, work on loosening up those bones. And that's stuff that I learned, you know, on the internet. I remember originally watching Kelly Starrett videos. Um, he's known as the ready state these days and using some of his self-mobilization techniques did a lot for me. And those, uh, and, and those are just very helpful in general. If you've had previous ankle sprains, you might have a, you know, an ankle that's a bit locked down, just protect, trying to protect you in a certain way and helping restore some of that motion to your heel bone or to your talus can, can really make a big difference. When, when something feels like it's not aligned very well, um, the chances are, you know, it might not be aligned very well and you have to kind of realign it and then train with the ankle that way. So those are, those are first, first few things that come to mind for sure. Those are really great. And actually, as you were talking, I was trying the foot glove and it did feel pretty good. <laughs> it's right. a little weird at first, though, because you're like, wow, I don't really spread my toes out this much unless I get a pedicure and they put the thing between my toes. But it is right. uncomfortable yeah. at times, but it it definitely is beneficial. It makes a lot of sense. So that those were really great. Now, let's work our way up. Let's go above the ankle. So what types of muscle weaknesses or imbalances can kind of trip trickle down to ankle instability and what should we be focusing on? Yeah, so I think the tibialis is overrated, honestly. Like I know it's been a big trend in the last little while and I don't think it's a mistake to to train it, but I think it already gets a lot of training just from running and jumping naturally, you know, when our heel hits the ground, the tibialis you know, it goes through an eccentric contraction to decelerate our foot. And generally speaking, that's not a huge issue when it comes to ankle instability. A strong soleus is going to do a lot more for you. And that's our bent knee calf raise, right? Like a seated calf machine. That's probably, if I had to pick one machine in the gym to use for better ankle health, it would be the seated calf raise machine. I'm pretty addicted to that machine at this point, mostly for the benefits of improved dorsiflexion. Like if you can you don't, and sometimes you don't even need to put that much weight on it. But if you spend a good couple seconds in that bottom position where your ankle's dorsiflexed, you're getting a stretch on that soleus. That's a good way to restore some, some dorsiflexion, at least in the short term. And that's a, I'm a big fan of doing that, you know, at the start of a workout. And that's something I got from Charles Poliquin on his, uh, on his website. He was a big proponent of doing some seated calf raises at the start of a lower body workout because you could open up that range of motion and then you'd be able to use that range of motion with other exercises like squats or deadlifts or split squats, for example. So that's a, uh, that's a huge one. And the soleus, like the cross sectional area of the soleus, if you were to cut your leg and look down from the top, like it's a huge chunk of that lower limb musculature, almost bigger than the gas rock. So it's uh, I find it's one that's neglected for whatever reason. In training and it's it's really important one that like i said i'd start most of my workouts with and also good to train that muscle isometrically with different lunge hold variations or different bent knee 
you know, heel up variations, not only because, you know, it's good to train muscles isometrically in general, and, and it's good for a lot of different stability variations as well. But like I said, uh, when it comes to knee rehab, the soleus also plays an important role in controlling your, your tibia and your shin movement. So that's another extra reason to, to train the soleus hard and to train the soleus with some isometric variations is because it's going to help your ankle health. And it's also going to help protect your knee from some potential injury as well. And then when it comes to the gastroc, the gastroc or the gastrocnemius, the gastroc for short, that's a pretty classic calf muscle that you can kind of see on people. That's your standing calf raise muscle. And, you know, that muscle gets a lot of work too when it comes to running and jumping. And actually, if I had to pick one variation that would get you the most bang for your buck, a standing calf raise trains your gastroc and it trains your soleus, whereas a seated calf raise only gets the soleus. So if you had to pick one, you might want to go with the standing calf raise, but uh, most of the time it's good to mix them both in. And when it comes to other areas up the chain, I think the hip plays a really important role as well with ankle health and ankle stability because, you know, we have lines of fascia that go from our feet and ankles all the way up to our hip. And the rotation at the hip, the internal and external rotation at the hip also translates down to the pronation and supination at the foot and ankle. So if you have limited internal rotation at the hip, that's going to affect your ankle mobility and stability at the, at the foot and ankle as well. So I know for me personally, that was an issue that I, like when my ankles were a mess, my hips were a mess. And I tried, I essentially rebuilt them both at the same time. Like when my met, when I, my ankles were messed up and the surgery happened, I started working on my hips as well. But I noticed that, Hey, when my hips feel really good and I have adequate rotation through my hip, my ankle, like I, f- I felt a difference at the floor in terms of just being connected to the floor and having that connection between the hip and the foot. So training those hip rotators, like the glute med, glute min, sometimes those can be overrated too with certain, uh, I guess, rehab approaches. But I think that they're really valuable when it comes to restoring some foot and ankle health for sure. That's great. And I think when it comes to these injuries, people think that we should just focus on the muscles closest to where the injury was, but I'm so glad that you mentioned the hips and a little bit higher up and how that can impact the whole chain. Now, as far as like more of the minor ankle sprains, I think a lot of athletes just kind of brush them off and they're like, all right, I can either play through this or I can rush my rehab. My ankle isn't swollen like a baseball. It's not bruised. I'm going to be fine. But how can these minor ankle sprains lead to catastrophes down the road? Like even a worse ankle sprain and a break like you had, or even an ACL tear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So great point. Something that happened to me when I tore my ACL actually is about two weeks prior to me tearing my ACL. Actually, no, it was one week prior. I had, uh, I had sprained my ankle on the same side. I had a classic, you know, ATFL sprain where your ankle, you know, you basically land on someone's foot and roll to the side. Right. And that can be a problem because now when you're every time your foot hits the ground, that ankle isn't giving your whole leg as much stability as it's used to as much stability as it needs. So, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm convinced that that was one of many factors in my ACL injury was that, you know, I suffered an ankle an ankle uh, sprain a week prior. And, you know, those that instability, or that inhibition can lag, you know, it's not even like if you get away or you're, you're, you get off a week or two without getting hurt that you're all of a sudden okay. Because, you know, you have to reestablish the muscles being able to fire a lot of times. Those muscles on the side of the ankle, if you suffer a classic ankle sprain, a lateral ankle sprain, you know, the fibularis longus, the fibularis brevis, some of these muscles aren't going to be as engaged as they're used to. And you got to kind of re-engage those muscles, wake them back up, make sure they're working well, get some soft tissue release through those muscles, just to make sure that the ankle is able to stabilize as best it can. And like you said, not only is that an issue for the ankle itself, because a lot of times it's that same ankle that we heard again. It's, it's, it's such a classic story in, in physiotherapy clinics or any athlete where, you know, they sprained that one ankle and it was never the same or they sprained it and, you know, it, they got out of pain, but their dysfunction wasn't actually addressed. 
And when, when I'm talking about dysfunction, I'm talking about restoring your proprioception and your balance. So, you know, we got to look at, okay, and we can always use, or not always, but most of the time we can use the other ankle, the other foot as a, as a comparison, right? So that's a good way to see, okay, hey, is my ankle still affected by that previous sprain? Like, can I balance on this ankle for as long and as easily as the other side? Can I balance on it with my eyes closed for as long and as easily as the other side? Can I do these single leg stability drills, like a hip airplane? very slowly? Am I able to balance on something that's, you know, a little bit unstable, like a wobble board or foam pad? I've had, you know, people tell me that you need to, you need to stand on a foam pad for up to five minutes, not straight necessarily, but that's the kind of time that you want to try to accumulate to help reestablish that connection between not only your, your brain, but also your hip, because a lot of the everters of the ankle, that fibularis and those perennial muscles, those are innervated by the same nerve as your, uh, your glute meat is innervated by the same nerve. Like the S1 nerve root is innervating your hip abductors as well as your, your foot everters. So sometimes you got to address both of those. I know I've had therapists tell me that, Hey, when, when you have an ankle sprain, a lateral ankle sprain, you got to treat the lateral hip at the same time. You got to wake those muscles back up too, because there's a connection between like we were talking about earlier, there's that connection between the hip, and the connection between the foot. So that's uh that's something else to consider but yeah just uh just generally speaking more risk of injury for that same ankle more risk of injury for you know joints and tissues up the chain and then also just through compensation you might start loading your other leg a little bit more because you know that ankle hasn't recovered it's a bit weaker and then you start to deal with you know overuse and fatigue issues on the other side Thanks for that. I think it's so important for people to just remember that even these minor injuries really need to be treated with great care. And too often I've seen with minor ankle sprains, a lot of physical therapists rush the process or an athlete's not working with the the right person. So what should be a reasonable timeline to kind of get back from a grade one or grade two ankle sprain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think something that I've noticed over the years is that it kind of depends on some of the stuff. I, and I wish it wasn't this way. I wish, you know, you didn't need or equipment or external things didn't help, but they they do. In my experience, it's it's been such a game changer to have something like a complex muscle stimulator because getting rid of the swelling or evacuating the swelling is really the first priority. And, and that can delay your healing process, you know, weeks after a significant ankle sprain. And generally at grade one, you won't have a ton of a ton of swelling, which is nice. And, and you can be back and, you know, I, I mean, honestly, you can not even miss time for a grade one sometimes, depending on how strong your ankle is and how strong your leg is. But generally, you know, a week or two is sufficient in my books for a grade one ankle sprain. And then you're looking at more like two to four weeks or even up to six for a grade two, depending on the severity. But that being said, a lot of it depends on how quickly you can evacuate that swelling, because that's really the first priority. You're not going to be able to do much when your ankle is is super swollen and the best thing I've seen work for that is is a muscle stain where you put a pad on the bottom of the foot a pad on the top of the foot and then a pad on the, the VMO on the quad and a pad on the, the gas rock or right behind the knee and what that does is it just activates your muscles and takes advantage of those lymphatic vessels to flush the swelling out of your ankle help it's ideal when it's above your heart you know and you maybe put a little bit of compression above it but like I said, in my experience, that worked super well. When I had my ankle surgeries, my ankle would swell like crazy for almost a year after the surgery, you know, after I would play on it, you know, I still wasn't fully recovered. And and that's a good gauge for, for you know, if, if you're healed, if your body is still sending fluid to the affected tissues or to the joint, that's a reflection that, hey, you've, you've just put that joint in an environment that it wasn't prepared for. And it might not be 100%. If you're doing things that you were used to doing, but your ankle is still swelling and that doesn't mean you can't play necessarily, but just good to know, like, Hey, if my, if my joint is still swelling, then that means there's still work to be done. Like these, I'm, I'm putting these tissues in an environment or giving them stimulus that they're not prepared for. So getting that swelling out is, is really key. And then restoring your range of motion is, is going to be important too. If you are lacking that dorsiflexion, especially that's going to really take a toll on a lot of your athletic movements. You're going to feel that you're compensating and you're not able to, you know, get in and out of cuts and jumps and things like that as well. And then restoring that balance and proprioception is the thing that can take a while as well. That single leg balance and just that, that connection to the foot. So 
yeah, the uh, the biggest piece of advice I would have is, is getting a, a muscle stim because they're really not that expensive, you know, 100 to 200 bucks. And for me, that's been like easily the best investment I've made as an athlete because um, it's, it's super useful, whether it's post-surgery swelling or whether it's, you know, you sprain your ankle that day and, and you know, usually depending on how bad it is, you're like, okay, there's some swelling coming, but you can get ahead of it. So I remember a couple of years ago when I was playing basketball in Asia, I, I had sprained my ankle and I finished the game, but I knew, okay, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, this isn't going to be great. You know, I'm going to have some swelling here. So you can get ahead of it. You can put the muscle stem on that night and start to start to evacuate some of the fluid that you know is coming. It's kind of like if you knew that you're going to get two feet of snow, like you had a snowfall warning. And you know, like, hey, if, when I go to bed and I wake up tomorrow morning, there's going to be two feet of snow. And it's going to be tough to shovel that two feet of snow. But if you, and let's say sleep's not really that important in this conversation. If you were to get up every hour and go on your driveway, you could sweep off like an inch of snow, no problem. And that's essentially what we're doing when we're putting the muscle stem on ahead of time, being proactive with it is, we're evacuating some of that fluid that's going to the area. We're allowing the fluid to go there because, you know, we still want some of that fluid to go there. We don't want to completely inhibit the fluid, but we don't want it to, to kind of get stale there. We don't want it to get stuck down there for too long. So making sure that we, we get it out of there, you know, before it gets to be too much of a problem is important. And, and that's the biggest factor in terms of healing up or I won't, I won't say accelerating the healing process because I don't actually think we can accelerate the healing process very much. But I think that's just the normal time frame that, you know, an ankle sprain will go through is, is you can be back pretty quickly. You know, it shouldn't be several, several weeks for a minor ankle sprain by any means. Now, is there anything else everyone should consider to protect their ankles? Anything you want to end on that we didn't discuss yet? Yeah. So I would say expose your ankles to some inversion. That's another thing that, uh, that I started doing when, when I got hurt or after my surgery is that classic, you know, lateral ankle position where you, where you roll the ankle, you can load your ankle in that position and you can get stronger in that position and you can strengthen those tissues on the lateral side of your foot and ankle that are normally hurt and they become more resilient. Like I can't, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but I've definitely ended up in that position many, many times over the last 10 years. And, and I've been okay. Like you, you kind of, it, it kind of wakes you up a little bit. You're like, Oh, and and then normally when you would have had a sprain or some tissue damage, just because your tissues have been there, they're strong there. You've spent some time with some load under those tissues and their length and position. They're just more resilient to, to a little bit of load there. So I would say that's something that uh, I don't see a lot because I mean, it's uh it's not, it's, it's a little bit tricky where if you have tissue damage there already, you want to wait probably till that's healed before you start to load that you want to be very, you know, very careful and gradual with that. But it's also probably better to do that with no shoe or a shoe with a very small platform rather than say, for example, if you, uh, if you're wearing like a, a high top basketball shoe that has like an inch of padding, if you were to put your ankle in inversion with that, there's, there's more of a stretch on those tissues and more significant load where I'd suggest starting out just trying to do that barefoot, you know, walking in that position a little bit barefoot, doing some squats in that position, barefoot, maybe you know, holding on to something at the start, but you, I mean, you can see people and, and I've worked up to the point where now, like I can jump on my ankles and, and land on the lateral side and, and it's fine. You know what I mean? And 10 years ago, I would have said no way, like no chance of even trying that, you know what I mean? But you know, when I'm just waiting in line at the grocery store now, I'll just kind of stand in inversion with my ankles rolled to the side. And it's just, I view it as training in a lot of ways. So that's something I think that is pretty valuable for people. And and the other thing too would just be, you know, single leg plyometrics where we don't necessarily get a lot of repeated jumps on the same leg in our sport. A lot of it's, you know, one jump at a time on each leg, whereas extensive, you know, small and also more intense plyometrics uh, can do a lot to improve your, your ankle stability as well and your ankle strength. And I think that that should be a staple in everyone's program, you know, in season and, and off season as well. Um, and, and those are tricky because sometimes when you're coming off of injuries, those are those, and that's the thing that you want to check to make sure is, is equal to the other side coming off injuries. It's like, Hey, can we do some of these single leg plyometrics in free and at the same rate or have the same performance as the other ankle? So 
I think, uh, you know, getting those in is really important as well. Brilliant. I think this was really great. And I want everyone to follow up with you because your Instagram is amazing and you have such great content on there with what you're doing with your athletes. So where can everyone find you? Yeah. So you can find me at the fixed physio. I'm the fixed physio because I've had both my legs fixed by orthopedic surgeons. So that's my name and that's my business name as well. You can find me at thefixedphysio.com or yeah, like I said, on Instagram at thefixedphysio. Awesome. So everyone be sure to follow up with Sean. I wish I had him when I was going through my ankle sprains and rehab and would have definitely saved some other injuries down the road, but be sure to give him a follow and start implementing some of the things we talked about in this episode, get your feet strong, get your ankle strong, but get your total body strong. That's really what it's all about. So Sean, thank you again. And everyone, I will see you on the next episode.